When I accepted the call to become minister of this church 26 years ago, there was a combination of things that really attracted me to come here. So I thought I would share a couple of those as we look at our history. One of the things that attracted me was that we had a dynamite choir. And as a matter of fact, somebody gave me a tape, I think it might have been Dave and Sherry Wazner sent a tape to us of the choir. And that made a difference, so thank you for that. I loved the sanctuary with the stained glass windows. And most of you know that the, these windows were in our previous church for about 91 years, and now they're here. And they somehow set a mood for us, which is always inspiring. I want to tell you that in some ways, the search committee that was uh, talking to me really treated me well. And they treated me well in a way that was noticeably different from some of the other search committees. So I just want you to know that. They were welcoming good people. And then, believe it or not, one of the things that attracted me here was the history of this congregation. So I was fascinated to see this kind of small church in a not huge Midwestern city that had this amazing history, including things like the Sunday evening lectures that took part in the early 20th century with people like Jane Addams and Clarence Darrow, the stories about the large membership that happened in this church in the early part of the 20th century around that same time. The tie-in to Tobias and Lydia Moss Bradley was fascinating. And the fact that our minister, Fred Lachaine, uh, was on the Selma March. What a fascinating part of our history. All of these stories made an impression on me, and they created interest and excitement for me about this congregation. So I had the sense that there were real possibilities in this community, a congregation that had already accomplished uh, some amazing things in its past. And so that, that was enticing to me when I came here. And I had the sense that there would be real possibilities in the future as well. That's, that's what it kind of suggested to me. Well, shortly after I was here, the church celebrated its 150th anniversary. Boy, that was a big deal. So here we are now, a quarter of a century after that 150th anniversary, and celebrating another milestone of history. So who could have predicted 25 years ago what our situation would be like in 20, 000, 20, 2017 and 2018? Who would predict that? Who would have known that we would build a new building on this gorgeous piece of land? We had no idea about that at that time. Who would have known that in 2017 we would be in such a tumultuous and angry political situation in our country? Who could have known that a half a century after the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, there would we would still be so far from racial justice and peace about those issues. Who would have thought in a time when we seem to be making progress? Who would predict that a small little rogue nation would be threatening us with nuclear weapons? I don't think we saw that coming. Who would have thought that a country as scientifically advanced as the United States would not be playing a leading role in the response to climate change and actually would be one of the troublemakers. Who would have thought that that would be our role? We live in an unpredictable world. 
There's no doubt about it. And that is tough to bear sometimes, but actually the unpredictability of the world is a reason to hope. Because it always means that we don't know exactly what's going to happen. We can't know that. So we actually, we never have enough, enough information to give up. Because we don't know well enough what is going to happen. So in a sense, that's, that's a reason for hope. One of the reasons that communities like ours exist is to provide a broader context in which to see the challenges of our times, or any other times. To see a bigger picture that is larger than what is going on at any specific moment. Because at any specific moment, it might, lo might not look like things are going that well. And so communities like ours, one of our challenges is to paint that broader picture and to see how we fit into that picture, to see who or what we could rely on, what is trustworthy, and to see how we fit in. How can we care for each other? And what actions can we take to do the most good possible given our circumstances? given the times we have been given. This, in part, is why we exist, I think. So given that we live in times that in many ways are difficult and stressful and dangerous, how should we react to that? What is our path forward? Strangely enough, one of the things I believe we need to do in hard times is to have fun and to enjoy life. I think we need to celebrate the joys of our lives, like my friend Glenn coming here 50 years ago, and the church having a 175th anniversary, and all these wonderful things that are worth celebrating. The beauty of the woods is worth celebrating. So, I think one of our roles is to enjoy life, to enjoy good company, getting together, enjoy food and drink and to laugh and tell stories and dance. Do you remember the time that such and such happened? Tell that story. So life is full of opportunities to enjoy and I think it's not wise stewardship of the gifts of life to let these moments pass by without honoring the beauty and the lusciousness of life. So I think that's one of the things we need to do. Let the good times roll even in the midst of hard times. So that's one little piece of wisdom that I think is important for us to follow. Now related, but not exactly the same, is that we are called, I think, to take care of ourselves and each other. I think that's part of what we're called to do. Part of our essence is to be a caring community. So our cards and phone calls and lunches and covenant circles, and hospital visits and exercise buddies, even if we don't always go to exercise, we can celebrate our, we have an exercise buddy anyway. <laughs> that's a kind of caring. Even better if we go. <laughs> and even our memorial services are all dimensions of this caring, ways to express it. But underneath all these is a simple attitude of simply caring for and about each other. And we need to care for ourselves as well. The ancient aphorism, love thy neighbor as thyself, requires loving ourselves just as much as we love others. That's actually what that saying says. So it doesn't mean be mean, love your neighbor and be mean to yourself. It doesn't say that. It says love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's what it says. So self-care is part of the caring spectrum. And caring, I think, is part of our essence as a community. Now, building on a foundation of enjoying the gifts of life and caring for ourselves and others, then I think we need to work together 
than to address the profound needs of our community and our wider world. We need to organize ourselves in this work in the most efficient and effective way possible and do as much good as we can without burning ourselves out or inadvertently creating more problems than we solve. Two great challenges of trying to help out in the world. To not burn ourselves out and not inadvertently create more problems than we solve. So we need to be people who know how to work together to get through all the pitfalls of human interaction and make good things happen. This is a skill set that develops over a lifetime, how to do this without getting all kinds tangled up. We have an impressive number of people in this community with these kinds of skills. It is, it's extraordinary, and we are fortunate to be in that position. But we can all continue to grow in this direction. Human beings working together, a profound challenge in all times and all places for us to be able to do that and to keep our goodwill and to keep moving in a positive direction. That skill set, by the way, has survival value in the world. That's a survival element for humanity. So where should we focus our energies as we work together? In these demanding times, where should we focus our passion and goodwill? So, I want to suggest that our tradition and our innate moral sense both point in at least one clear-cut direction, and that is the direction of protecting human rights and civil rights. I think our tradition is absolutely clear on this. Our very first UU principle lifts up the worth and dignity of every person, and our universalist heritage proclaims that no human being is headed to an eternal hell, which is another way of saying that every person has worth and dignity. It's another way of stating that truth. It doesn't mean that people are not responsible for their actions. We're all responsible for our actions all the time. But in our tradition, we are counseled not to divide people into the good and the evil, the saved and the damned, or any other binary category like that. In traditional language, we would say that all people are God's children. But we can say everyone has worth and dignity, and it means the same thing. So we're compelled, I think, and our tradition teaches us to speak up for the civil and human rights of all people especially in these times. And that includes Muslims, LGBTQ people, women, children, immigrants, African Americans, Native Americans, and really just everyone. That's another way, just everyone. We are on a solid track, I think, whenever we defend human rights, the rights of people to live in peace and have a fair shot in life. And our country, sad to say, is going through a little time here where we are off the track in this department. We are not on track right now. In this era of a kind of persistent bigotry and racism that is really coming out and being more expressive at this time, Islamophobia, and a host of other small-minded and mean-spirited delusions. Our neighbors in St. Louis right now are going through another troubling incident where justice seems to remain a distant goal and seems to get farther away right now. So part of our historic role is to make our voice heard for the rights of all people to live in peace and be treated fairly. This is not, as they say, rocket science. But it is our call to do this. This is part of what we are called to do, I believe. I want to add in this particular era that we live in, it's just not human and civil rights that are in danger, but I would suggest 
that it's really the ongoing existence of the great experiment in democracy called America. I, without wanting to mess up a, this beautiful day, there is an element in our country that actually is working to weaken the democratic institutions of our country and try to throw them into a kind of chaos where they don't work as they were designed or perhaps at all and then that creates the possibility to see democracy deteriorate and move into more of a kind of tyranny. So that is, that's a, we have to be conscious about that. And in our purposes and principles, we say we believe in democracy. That's one of our principles. So I think these are times in which we will need to defend democracy if we wish to have it continue. And so that should be right, that should be an easy thing for us to know about because it's right there in our tradition. Some of our Unitarian ancestors wrote some of those words at the beginning of our nation. That's where we belong. So we're going to have to lift up our voices for civil rights, including some things that at least some of us, not all of us, but some of us never thought were really in question. Things like voting rights. It never occurred to me when I was a kid that anybody would have a problem voting. Just, that just wouldn't enter into my mind. This is America. But we're going to have to think about those. We're going to have to think about equal rights in the criminal justice system and about due respect for our democratic institutions. So one of the realities of this time is that democracy is not guaranteed. There's no guarantee that we'll always have democracy. Democracy is something that has to be defended and worked for. And I think that is part of our calling. We have to make sure it survives. Now, Reverend William Barber, who is a Baptist preacher from North Carolina, I did a course on one of his books not too long ago, says that to make these things happen, we will need to form what he calls fusion coalitions. So we'll have to align ourselves with what he calls unlikely allies. So what is an unlikely ally? Well, I'll tell you, just the fact that Reverend Barber is a Baptist preacher puts me in an unlikely ally moment. <laughs> that's, you know, that's a bridge that needs to be crossed. But I get that he has a significant piece of the truth, and he's preaching that truth for us. Those of us who love freedom and civil rights and love democracy will have to do this in our country and let go of, I think, of trying to do it in other countries. This is the place where we need to establish democracy, if we can do it. And we're going to have to band together and all work to create this world we want to live in. We're going to have to band together and create these unlikely allies. So who would that be? All the black and brown and white people, the Muslims, the Christians and the Jews banding together, gay and straight people, southerners and northerners, people of different religions, people of different political ideas. We have to create bonds with all these people if we're going to have this life that we want to live. We cannot go it alone. We cannot say, oh, the Universalist Unitarian Church, we have all those answers. That's great. We do have some. We have a piece of the puzzle, but it's not good. This, the UU Church is not going to fix the United States on its own. We can have a little memorial service for that idea. <laughs> Everybody brings something to the potluck. We have to reach out to allies who are likely and unlikely. Other faith groups and immigrant groups and racial justice groups and socially progressive groups and environmental groups. Everybody who wants the good life for everyone. Isolation will not work. It just won't work. 
We are not the chosen people. We are the people who are choosing to work with everyone. Everyone who will join together. So this is the direction where more hope and more love and more joy and more peace lie. Take care of ourselves and others. Savor the beauty of life. Work together for worthwhile goals. Protect civil rights and human rights for everyone. Who would we leave out? Who should we leave out of that? I can't think of anyone. Defend democracy, which is under attack and needs our conscious support to survive and flourish. And we need to build friendships and alliances across all the barriers that separate us from our potential friends. And we need to see the beauty in every human life. So make unlikely allies. Go out and hug a Baptist. <laughs> this afternoon. Or hug your grouchy uncle on Thanksgiving. The one that just irritates the dickens out of you. <laughs> Hug that one. Reach across the gap and speak out with strength, but also with civility and humanity, respecting everyone while not agreeing with everyone. So these are, I think, crucial elements of our tradition not the only ones, but they're part of our history and they're part of who we are. And they do provide a context for looking at the present moment and finding our spot, what we can do. So I hope we enjoy this year of celebration and reflection, but I hope it will be a year of action as well. The world needs us. The world needs every good soul in these hard times to help us get back on a healthier track. We are part of the amazingly creative fusion coalition that will help guide our society back onto the path of respect for all, and in some cases not back, but just plain forward. A country where the beauty of life is not a privilege for the few but for everyone. So that, I believe, is our call as we enter our 175th year. Our job is to answer that call once again, as so many of our people and others have done in the past. Let us care for ourselves and each other so that we may appreciate this beautiful life and so we may be energetic and faithful partners in the great interconnected coalition to bring love and justice to everyone.